Hey guys, if you listen to the podcast on Spotify, Spotify has a new rating system where you can rate the podcast on a one to five star basis. Apple's had this forever, but Spotify just released it. We currently have 16 five star reviews, a mighty 16, and we're building up. So if you enjoy the podcast, please go on Spotify, give us a rating. It helps bubble up this podcast to wrestling fans just like you. On with the show. Hey, look, like when you go in the in the practice room and you're wrestling all these guys, like your lights out, you know, you, you attack, you take them down, you keep wrestling, you blah, blah, blah. But then right when you go out there, you, you're happy winning three to zero. Like where, where are all these points? Where are all these moves? Where, are all, where's all this stuff that you do in the practice room? We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Welcome to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. It's Wednesday, January 5th, the year 2022. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. It's great to be back. Our guest today is Joey McKenna. Joey was a three-time All-American, wrestling for both Stanford and Ohio State. Now he wrestles for the Penn RTC. He was an Olympic trials runner-up, and he's still on the scene, still gunning for it. And I had a great time with Joey. Fan of the Week goes to a Twitter account that I love to follow. It's at Indiana Matt, wrestling coverage for the Crossroads State, Indiana. They do a great job, and I really appreciate their support. This episode is brought to you by WrestlersAreWarriors.com. It's Tony Rotundo's photography site. Tony Rotundo is one of the great wrestling photographers of all time. He's photographed many NCAA events. He's photographed the Olympics. And you can go to his website, WrestlersAreWarriors.com, search your favorite wrestler, and order a print. There's thousands upon thousands of photographs there. WrestlersAreWarriors.com. Check it out. And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for the pride of New Jersey, Joey McKenna. Joey McKenna, welcome to the podcast, man. Hey, Ryan. How are you? Glad to be on. Yeah, it's great to have you, man. A new year's here, and you're our first guest recording of 2022, man. So pumped to have you. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm excited to be the first ringing in a new year, and hopefully talk about some exciting things and wh- whatever you got in store. Yeah. So, I mean, you're now training at the Penn RTC. You're hitting the international circuit, and you've been doing so for quite some time. So I figure we could start with the first time you represented the red, white, and blue abroad. W- when was that tournament, and what kind of impact did that have on you? Yeah. So the first time I got to represent the good old Team USA and the United States across my chest was in 2012. So I made my first cadet world team. I went to the, back then it wasn't UWW, it was FILA still. So I went to the FILA cadets here in the States. Um, I made the team at 54 kilo, 119. Um, I believe it was right after my sophomore season at Blair. So right after my sophomore year of high school, made that um, cadet world team couple of my teammates were like Mark Gray. He was on some junior world teams and guys like that, that I looked up to. So that was the first time we went over to Baku, Azerbaijan for the cadet world championships. 
And we actually had a pretty, pretty stellar team, to be honest. I think it was Jabari Moody started us off. Um, Mitch McKee, Tommy Thorne, myself, Zane Rutherford, um, Jack Bass, Chance Marsteller, Garrett Ryan, Mitch Sliga. Oh man, I feel like I'm missing a few, but we had, <laughs> we had a we had a pretty star-studded team to be honest. Um, but that was the first time I got to represent the USA. Um, it didn't actually turn out the best in my favor. I, I made the, the quarterfinals and in the quarterfinals, I was wrestling Uzbekistan and I ended up breaking my upper humerus and dislocating my shoulder at the same time. So, wow. you know, match stop, it was about 20 seconds into the match guy locked up a two on one, locked his hands up on a key lock and then rolled my rolled through and took my arm all the way out. And, uh, yeah, went under my first major, um, my first major injury, first major surgery from that competition. And, uh, to be honest, after that, I probably thought that was my last time overseas, <laughs> kind of really? left a, a weird taste in my mouth. Like, man, that was super weird. Everything was all good. And then it just took a huge turn for the worse. Um, I ended up needing to fly back man, sooner than the team did, like 24 hours, my parents helped me get on a new flight and went back, immediately got surgery the next day after um, a wicked travel where half my family got left back in Italy based on the pilot uh, <laughs> spilt his coffee on the control panel. So we had the D plane off a fully plane, uh, <laughs> a fully boarded plane. And meanwhile, broken shoulder in a plaster cast, just like the old days, paper mache, it seemed like. <laughs> oh and uh, yeah, man, the pain was just sinking in worse and worse. So luckily, my dad and I got rerouted through London. We ended up getting back, um, getting to see the orthopedic surgeon. And I was in for surgery the next day before my mom and two sisters even made it back home from being overseas. What was the rehab process like for that? Yeah. So that was, that was a long one. And I actually got really lucky because like I said, it was a break of my upper humerus, which is the, uh, which is the arm bone. So it was actually a break of my bone and just the dislocated shoulder. They actually popped the shoulder back in mat side. And then I just had to deal with the broken arm. So I actually got lucky that it wasn't any sort of labrum rotator cuff, any type of ligament or joint injury, and that it was actually just a, a clean bone break. Because, you know, the bone definitely heals a lot stronger, especially back then. Yeah, I, I was 17 years old at the time. So um, the first major injury, first surgery. And yeah, that first overseas experience. Wow. And now you've like, you're a world traveler now, man. I mean, how many times have you gone over now in your, in your senior career? Yeah, a, a lot. Uh, I have a running list on the notes of my phone of all the countries I've been to. And I throw little asterisks next to the ones for wrestling, um, not just vacation and stuff. Um, I know in 2021, last season, I went overseas. I went to six different countries. Wow. So I went to six different countries in, you know, that big COVID, COVID year, I guess. And, you know, it was just exciting for me. An exciting time gave me a lot of hope. Um, during, during the COVID time to continue to get those overseas competitions, travel there and expose myself to some of the best wrestling in the world. Now, are you ever going just solo main on a mission, landing somewhere and like trying to make your way into a club and start training or is it all planned out ahead of time? Yeah, I've, so I've never done that. I've never just showed up and then tried to figure it out. Um, the biggest, I'd say I have two stories, uh, in 2021, actually, where it was kind of planned a little bit beforehand, but there was just a lot of trust, uh, you know, in the process of, you know, this is going to work out if it's meant to work out. And if not, it isn't. And the first one was back in uh, January, February. I had wanted to go overseas um, because of the big COVID delay and no competition for a while. End of 2020. I just had that itch. 
Um, I ended up wrestling Nation in the flow duel at the beginning of January last year, then Seth Gross a few days later. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I just knew I wanted to get overseas. So at first my sights were set on going to Vladikavkaz, going to Russia, trying to get over to Ossetia to train, but because of COVID, it just seemed really difficult. So I ended up just using my, my wrestling connections. I had gone overseas with athletes in action after my senior year at Ohio state in 2019 for a little mission trip, um, little faith and wrestling. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to Stephen Barrett, who was a NCAA champ for uh, Oklahoma State back in the day. He works with AIA and very closely, and he's just very connected overseas. So he ended up getting me in touch with um, a family that USA Wrestling was familiar with, the Karluk family over in Ukraine. And they ended up helping us get set up. There was a competition over in Ukraine but USA Wrestling wasn't actually sending a team over there just because of COVID and, and everything like that. And I went through that, that family and I was able to set up a great two week training trip for Dave McFadden and I, where we both went out on a limb, met, met our translator, met the family that was helping us out once we landed there, you know, had some contact beforehand, but had no idea what we were getting into, just going over there, ready to ready to meet the Ukrainian Federation, you know, pay what we need to pay for our hotels, for everything like that. And uh, they set us up really well. It ended up being an awesome trip. One of my first times I actually got to spend time training overseas before a competition. Mm -hmm. Um, Every other time had mainly been, you know, you show up that week of competition, usually with the Team USA delegation. We kind of have our structure. We we wrestle with our American guys, kind of get ready for the competition and then compete. And, you know, we went over there, not even knowing the language, had no coach with us. Luckily, uh, Valentin Kalika and some of the Columbia wrestlers were there as well. So we had some fellow Americans and someone to help translate practice. But it just showed me that wrestling was just, you know, a universal sport. It didn't matter whether I could understand, I could watch and learn the technique. And it was just great. And then the second time was in, uh, End of June, July, I wrestled in Poland in June at the ranking series event. And I kind of had met Haji Aliyev multiple times, but we ended up taking a picture there. I sent, he's like, Instagram, Instagram. So I sent (laughs) it to him on Instagram. And then he kind of asked me, hey, like, I would love to train, bro, like before the Olympics. And I was like, hey, this is a great opportunity. You know, go train with one of the best guys in the world at my weight. Also, we had kind of known it by that point that um, 65 kilo for the USA wasn't qualified. So I didn't feel any sort of um, just bad feelings about potentially getting a different guy ready because we didn't have a dog in the fight. So I thought it was just a great opportunity to train with the uh, train with a guy like Haji Aliyev, go over there, experience Azerbaijan um, again from back from 2012 <laughs> that cadet team coming full circle going back to baku Dang. and full and circle was, uh, full circle yeah and it was just a great trip um you know that time i did i did go over kind of blind i got in touch with um one of hajiliev's coaches he got me in touch with someone that spoke english and you know again i had the lot i had to trust a lot there because I needed a letter from the Azerbaijani Federation that I could come. And then I show up to the airport. They tell me I can't go. I'm trying to call up this guy. There, Which airport? In the, like in the States or you're already over there at the airport trying to no, get in? No, I was in Philadelphia and I was flying Qatar Airways through Doha to Baku, Azerbaijan. <sighs> and uh, yeah, there were just a lot of hurdles to go through, right? With documentation, what I had to show. They're like, well, you know, Americans can't go to Azerbaijan. I'm like, well, I'm training with the Olympic team and I'm showing them the letters that I have, right? They're like, well, it's in Azerbaijani. We can't read it. I'm like, uh, <laughs> let, let me try to figure something out for you. And, you know, luckily just with patience, with trust, contact and who I needed to contact, ended up getting on that flight and uh, spending six days overseas by myself, just training alongside um, the three Olympians that Azerbaijan had, they had Haji Aliyev, uh, Bayramov at 74 
and then Sharif Sharifov. So just training with those guys. There were some Dagestanis in there training as well. Um, and it was just, just a great Dang. environment. So totally opened my eyes, just seeing the way they train, trying to peak for a competition. I was about, uh, I think when I went like three weeks before the Olympics. So it was just great to see kind of what their, what their phase, what their kind of training phase was looking like and, uh, you know, getting on the courts, playing some tackle basketball, <laughs> so some other fun games as well. Dude, I love Haji. I actually have a picture of him versus Rashidov. Yeah, that that epic, uh, you know, from 2019, 2018. I can't remember exactly when, when there was that crazy last second scramble. It's one of my favorite. Out of matches. bounds. Yeah. Uh, that's yes, the, great Tony Rotundo. Out of bounds. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the picture, it's 7.3 seconds left, and he's just on that low single. And um, it's uh, it's one of the great shots Tony Rotunda sent me. So uh, wrestlers are warriors if you want a picture of it or a copy of it. But, dude. So bottom line, I'm obsessed with that dude and I want to hear all about it. So you get there. Where are you staying when you're there? Yeah. So I was very nervous. I'm like, Hey, what are the accommodations going to be like? I'm trying to plan this trip in advance. I'm, I'm kind of a planner kind of guy. So I'm like, Hey, what are the accommodations going to look like? Where am I going to stay meals, you know, transportation? How am I getting to practice? Like these things all need to be squared away. Cause once I get there, I can't speak anything, you know? So, um, they end up telling me, Oh, like you'll be staying with the team and everything else. So I ended up getting there. They brought me to a hotel. Um, I want to say, I don't, I can't confirm this, but I'm pretty positive. It was the same hotel that we stayed in our first night back in 2012. I don't know for sure, but, um, I was like, man, this place looks familiar. This hotel looks really familiar. I've only ever been here one time. <laughs> So there's no way, you know, I've seen it before, but I was in a, in a nice hotel. Um, I got in around 1 a.m. So they threw me in the hotel. I, I got in kind of jet lag was up until like four, ended up falling asleep uh, till six, woke up. was like, all right, I'm going to eat. I fell asleep eight to 12. And then next thing I wake up and there's a knock on my door and I answer it. And there's a guy standing there and it's this bearded guy, this clearly Russian guy. And he's like, room, room. So he like steps in the room. And meanwhile, I only have a king bed in my room. I have a single bed. And this guy comes in because the hotel guy came up with him was like, yeah, this is your roommate. I was like, uh, nowhere for him to go. <laughs> but Sure. They end up moving us into another room. Then they're like, oh, what are we doing? They put him with another guy, moved back into the original room. So I ended up having a nice king bed. Um, we were all on the same floor. All those Azerbaijani guys, all the Dagestan guys, the Russian, the, the Russian guys, we were all kind of hanging on the same floor. And um, we had our breakfast upstairs, lunch and dinner. We're over at the training hall. We got bussed over. What do you guys uh, have for times breakfast? A day. Like, what are you eating over there? Uh, breakfast is pretty similar pretty much everywhere you go overseas. There's usually some sort of egg, whether it's runny scrambled eggs or it's fried eggs or hard-boiled. Usually one of those three options. Some, uh, some mystery meats, usually some cold cuts and some cheeses. And then, like, tomatoes, cucumbers, stuff like that. I always bring over my own products. Um, I use a bunch of UCAM products, so I bring those over. I bring over some oatmeal, some bars, some protein, you know, just kind of <laughs> keep myself afloat because you never know what it's going to be like. But it ended up being great. I got some time. I ended up going to dinner with Haji Aliyev a few times. They got to show me around the city. Um, I explored Baku a bunch on my own and just opened my eyes. Um, you know, since I've gone over to those I don't want to call them rut, like just those Eastern Bloc, old Soviet yeah. countries, they all kind of speak Russian. So, you know, in lieu of that, I've been in the last few months, probably about six months or so, I've been trying to learn Russian a little bit more so that when I go over there, um, I just think they, they recognize there's a lot of respect for their culture, allows that respect between athletes to go. I mean, I saw how Kyle Snyder was responded to, you know, when we, we see he was overseas with Sajulayev and how those guys treated him and how much respect there was through the sport of wrestling, just for 
those cultures and stuff. And so I'm excited. I'm, I'm hoping to go back to Russia pretty soon here um, to hopefully utilize that. But wow, it's just easier, a lot easier to make friends, even knowing things like it's very nice to meet you. You know, it gets a smile on their face, a little laugh. And they're like, man, this, you know, this guy, he's not just here to wrestle, right? Like he's, he's a little more than that. So it's, it's fun to create those friendships and, and relationships with guys all across the world that, you know, wrestling has really, truly offered me. Wow, so that, it's been, been awesome to see. What a, uh, like you said, wrestling just, it kind of overcomes or, you know, overreaches boundaries and borders. And even if you can't speak the language, you're somehow able to understand them. And so you're, you're over there, the only American and you're training and, and you're staying at this hotel. What's the biggest difference in the trainings that you saw and the peaking? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, a lot of us right here in the States, we go through college wrestling and stuff like that. And, um, you know, with that, you end up doing a lot of volume goes, live goes, like 10 minute goes, 20 minute goes, things like that. And a lot of their, a lot of their wrestling was very short. The most we did in terms of minutes was like match length, you know, like a six minute or really two threes broken up. Um, we did a bunch of practice matches throughout the week. I was only there for six days and we did two different sets to kind of improve upon and stuff like that. The first one was more practice type. And then the second one was real refs, singlets, you know, the whole bit. Um, I noticed a lot that, you know, when they, we just drilling wise, they would get into a position and then spar it. So it made a lot of sense to me when you see like those 30 second spurts, minute spurts, from a lot of foreign wrestlers at the end of matches, it, it made more sense to me. Cause I'm like, Oh wow. Like, you know, they'll get to a leg and then it starts. So like their biggest thing is get to the leg and then it's, mm. so they don't really care how they get there sometimes, as long as they get there, then it's a wrestling position. So that kind of opened my eyes. I mean, just the free, the full freestyle focus. And, and even as down to the warm up. You know, Haji Aliyev ran us through every warm up. You know, it was led by the whole team, did it. You know, everybody jogged kind of behind the leader, did everything according to that. And, uh, you know, the, the whole lineup in front of practice, everybody lines up, then it starts. So just like the format, the structure, and then kind of the content, even of what we were doing. A lot of guys, too, I noticed, and I think you'll see this in a lot of top rooms around the country here in the US, but a lot of guys stayed after practice to work on technique. The technique kind of happened after practice, pulling a coach over, asking another guy. Um, so, I mean, I spent a lot of time trying, you know, to kind of ask guys, Hey, like I would just more do motion, right? Like, <laughs> you know, can you show me this piece, you know, that, so that was really interesting to me that that time was spent more so after practice and, the quality time spent in practice had a purpose from the coaches and then that technical piece afterwards, and then just organized games too. Um, some practices were organized games where we played 40 minutes of basketball, you know, something like that, where it was completely different, but man, our heart rates were up the whole time because they also don't dribble the basketball. So <laughs> you're <laughs> sprinting down the court from side to side versus running and dribbling. Yeah. It's like you always see those videos in, in the Russian countries or, or former Soviet bloc countries, as well as Russia, the, the basketball is a warm up. man. We so had a, we had a, we had a hoop in the Ohio state room. That was definitely a highlight for us and a highlight for the visiting teams that we wrestled. We'd always come in, they'd be playing on the hoop before practice. It was just a great, great way to warm up. I like yep. uh, the American version a little better, a little more control. What's the American version? <laughs> dribbling? Dribbling. Okay. They don't do, Okay. It's funny. Well, they don't call fouls over there either. It, There's no it, fouls. Just As a middle up. schooler, you don't even realize that you're doing something that like other, because we would do that in middle school, kind of like, but it wasn't basketball. It was like the mat tape at the end of a tournament. And you'd have like yes. a huge roll of it. And we play it like maybe once a week and it was awesome. But you know, the parents are trying to get you out of there. The coaches are trying to roll the mats up and you're still trying to leapfrog over them. So uh, that's the most we did of it. But when you see, you know, like what you guys are talking about, 
playing as an actual warm up, be like, man, we were onto something. Yeah, that's funny. That's a good memory. Every I think every team did that. Every right? every elementary, middle school, high school team roll that roll that tape ball up, make it as big as possible, and shoot it on the hoop. Absolutely. Dude, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Ohio State because Tom Ryan's one of my favorite people. And I know you you had a, a couple great years there. Talk about just the biggest impact of spending some time around Tom Ryan and the Buckeye staff. Yeah, so that that was a great, great part of my career. Um, you know, when I look back on my college career from Stanford to Ohio State and everything in between, um, I, I wouldn't want to change anything about it. I learned a lot about myself throughout that time, about who I was as an individual, what I stood for, what I believed in. And um, going to Ohio State and being around guys like Tom, Tervell, Jay, Logan, Coach Ralph, and then teammates, Kyle, Miles, Nate, Bo, Colin. Man, I mean, the list Ooh. just goes on. It was just it was fun to be around. It was motivating. And I, I had noticed that on my recruiting trip there when I just sat there and watched practice, you know, I, I wasn't allowed to practice. So I just sat there on the bench in the old Steelwood wrestling facility. And, um, there was just something different. I, I felt a fire in the room, just watching guys compete against each other and just the energy, like the motivation that I felt was just exciting. And the way Tom kind of got everybody excited and was kind of that goofy, serious guy. Um, to me, that's kind of how he always came off, right? He has that side where he's going to joke around, but right. He was an Iowa wrestler, so he, he can plug in. Mm -hmm. He can definitely plug in. And you, you could tell when, when it was serious and when, when it wasn't. And, um, you know, he's kind of been over backwards for me, been, been a great coach, great leader. Um, I thought he did a great job of leading that team. Well, what he introduced, to our team in terms of leadership and what we were doing outside of the wrestling room as well. Um, I think that's what really helps that program continue to be top five, top 10 program yearly. And since Tom has been there, um, you know, I think he did a good job too of being able to extend those duties to those other coaches. I know Tervell, you know, was a huge, huge influence on my mindset and helping me kind of tap in and just like that pressure that I put on myself, just that performance anxiety really helped me let go of that a little bit and just try to unlock my full potential as I go out there. Just care less about, you know, the, the results of it, but just putting on a performance, seeing that mat as my canvas and um, allow me to just kind of perform out there and, you know, show, showcase my craft. So he really helped with that. Jay and Logan, um, every, every morning, every day, you know, whether I was working with those guys or just jagging around, no pun intended, <laughs> you know, we'd just be hanging out and, and just shooting it. Just great people, great people, great perspective on the sport. I mean, Logan had done what I'd wanted to do, right. He was a four-time NCAA champ, one of the best at my weight class and being around a guy like that to learn from him. Uh, learn from him that first year when he was an RTC athlete. And then that second year where he was just kind of full-time invested into me was just great experience. And um, yeah, I just continue. I just hope to continue to see success out of that program. I'm excited about that recruiting class. Ooh. They got, got a, got a bunch of hammers. Tom and, Ryan's um, out there on the streets, man. He is, he's out yeah. for blood. I love it. And uh, cause I, I was, I was thinking back to when you were there, that was right during that peak Penn State rivalry time, right? Yeah. So when I transferred there, um, you know, I transferred there with hopes we're going to beat Penn State this year. You know, we we wanted to do it. We had the team. We we were definitely capable. Uh, we fell short in the duel. Um, you know, Where duel didn't duel really at? go. Our, the duel was in Rec Hall. Was it crazy we were, or what? Yep, we were <laughs> we were packed in Rec Hall. Uh, with 6,000 fans, even though a match like that would have definitely, especially that year with the teams we both had, would have sold probably 20,000 seats for sure, would have sold out the BJC. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think Kale made the decision to, to host it in Rec Hall. And hey, I mean, you know, the, what, there's definitely some strategy behind that. It was good experience. I'd only ever wrestled in there 
at that point as a Stanford athlete in rec hall. So that was a very interesting dynamic to kind of to see from being on the Stanford team to being on the Ohio State team, how the student section treated you, <laughs> the fans, uh, you know, a lot of that was was much different. But it was an exciting duel. You know, we came out, we came out out hot, won the first three. We were up 10 0. Um, I think then Zane put some points back on the board. Then Mickey Jordan came out. I think we were up 14 to five at the half, something like that. Wow. And uh, yeah, tough, tough loss by the squad. And then, of course, at nationals, you know, pretty much it was, I think there's a lot of things that we could have done to win. Um, there, there's definitely a mutual accountability that needs to be held within the whole team and all the individuals on the team. But, you know, once, unfortunately, once uh, Bo Nickel pin miles that, that put it out of reach. And, you know, we were hoping it was going to come down to Snyderman, Snyderman and Kuhn. Um, you know, anybody you want to leave that pressure to, it's definitely Kyle. Uh, we definitely felt that at, on our team. And we were like, man, no, no other guy to put the weight of the world on his shoulders than Kyle Snyder. But, you know, unfortunately that didn't happen. We were so close. I think we were the record scoring highest second place team ever um, in any other year, the NCAA tournament. I think that amount of team points usually is championship worthy. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, it was, a, it was a great, great run. We didn't end up doing it. Um, but man, we had a, we had a great team and that was a fun, fun Ohio state team to be a part of, especially in my first transfer year out. Um, a lot of energy around that team, a lot of great individuals, uh, role models and friends on that team. And yeah, man, those 2017, 18 bucks were Dude. definitely pretty tough. <laughs> uh, and you guys won the big tens that year, right? Yes, we did. So, yep. We won the big tens. Um, and that's huge. I mean, it's only been like so many teams to do that in the past, like 40 years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Nolf was out. Nolf did forfeit out that, that competition. So there was definitely some points left a little yep. bit on the board respectfully yep. Uh, yep. for sure to Jason. Um, but yeah, he ended up wrestling the NCAA tournament and, you know, again, a lot of things that could have happened for us to win. Um, but that's the year yeah. Hidley and Nolf had a burner in the semis, right? Yes. Yes. Came down to, you know, crazy calls and like, just because the year before they met in the finals, good match, not as close, but that one, it was like, you remember watching that one. You're like, that could be the team race. That could be Hidley's first shot at, at gold. You know, it was just like so many matches like that going on that year, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Fun, fun to think back on. I just love when there's a big team race. And, you know, this year the team race just got crazy. You know, best wishes to the great Spencer Lee, uh, but he's going to be out, which is, you know, news to all of us. Um, and I, I look back to some of your high school battles. Of well, course, you wrestled for Jeff Buxton at Blair Academy, one of my favorite people. And you were at the Ironman wrestling guys like Kemmerer. Spencer Lee was kind of coming onto the scene at that time. And, uh, I mean, you wrestled so many guys that are, you know, household names and obviously you're a household name but one that comes to mind is uh, your battle with Kemmerer at the Ironman and then the Powerade what do you remember from those scraps back in the day yeah yeah so my junior season um, was when I wrestled Kemmerer at the Powerade so my junior season like I said earlier my injury happened right after my sophomore year so that was in August of 2012 um, so I didn't wrestle the power aid was actually my first competition back in my wow. junior season that year. So I sat out the Ironman and I sat out the beast of the East in early December, but my, my true clear date was January 1st, but because the power aid was right before, you know, and I was doing well in my rehab and everything like that, the doctor cleared me to compete a week earlier. So I was excited. I was excited to get in there and go win the Powerade. We had a pretty tough, uh, pretty tough weight class. I want to say Connor Schramm, my, my future roommate at Stanford, Connor <laughs> Schramm was in there. Um, Ryan Deal, another, another good name, went to Maryland and Kemmer. So I wrestled Kemmer in the semifinals and uh, I ended up losing. I ended up losing a tight one, one point match, ended up 
taking third. I think uh, I want to say Shram beat him in the finals for first. Wow. But yeah, lost to Kemmer my junior season, first tournament back and at 126. Um, I had actually wanted to go 132 that season. And I ended up moving up to 132 a few duels later. But my coaches just thought it was best for me and my doctor as well. Just first outing back to be at that lower weight class. Um, I was a little smaller at the time too, but I just wanted to start to get into those upper weights a little bit. So Is I wanted to make pull? that jump. Um, it was pretty hard. 126 was pretty hard. I wrestled it for the Powerade. And then our next dual meet was the Graham dual meet. And I wanted to go up to 132 and wrestle Mickey Jordan. Um, but again, because I was just first, first few outings back, they ended up holding me out and just keeping me down at 26 um, for those few. It was, a, it was a good pull, but then once I went up to 32, ended up going up to 32 right after that dual meet, wrestled Dean Heil um, and some other guys that were pretty big names up at 32 as well. And you wrestled Heil in high school as well. I didn't know that. So me and Heil, if there's, if there's actually one guy that I've probably been a true rival with, it's, it's actually Dean Heil, to be completely honest. I wrestled him for the first time. My, one of my first, I think it was my first tournament of champions, Ohio TOC ever, the, the takedown tournament. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had Dean Heil first match. I had no idea who this guy is. I end up going out there and lose. It was a 10 point tech. There was no really riding or anything. It was kind of like freestyle. They'd give you 10 to 20 seconds and then they bring you back up to your feet. And I lost my first match to Dean Heil, 10 to zero. And I ended up wrestling back, taking fourth place, um, you know, all the way back from first round loss. Is this the Tulsa champion, Joy McKenna, or is this the unproven Joy McKenna at this time? I might, I might've been unproven. I was, I was pretty good. Um, okay. I, I mean, I was definitely a name, but yeah. I, I'd never heard of Dean Heil. You know, you I had heard of some other round. names, of course, first round. I think it was zero seeds at that tournament, anything like that. And we were just bam. And so that was the first time Dean Heil was ever on my radar. And as a little kid, uh, you know, we chased, we chased him down. We went to the Dixie nationals in Georgia, the Liberty nationals, Tulsa nationals. And I, I, I don't even know if I could, if I could even find all the matches we've wrestled, but it's gotta be over 20 matches come between wow. high school, between middle school, elementary, high school and college and even senior level. That's crazy. Cause I remember the match at the scuffle as a, were you a freshman? Yep. Yes, yeah. I was a freshman. Cause I coached a kid one year at Tulsa who was in your bracket. Shout out Tony DeFreeze if you're listening. And uh, you uh, you won the thing, I believe. And um, you were wrestling out of New Jersey at the time. And then lo and behold, go to Blair. And so I just always knew your name was kind of following you. And then, I mean, Scuffle was like, dang. It, it was it used to be such a, it still is a tough tournament, but it was more like varsity squads going. Now I feel like it's a lot of like backups and, you know, red shirts going. But back then it was loaded, man, and, and you wrestled him to a really tight match there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I so I wrestled him in the finals. Um, I want to say he was ranked number one at the time as well. Yeah. Um, Dean had been ranked number one, and yeah, I lost in, I want to say it was like ride outs, I think. <sighs> Dang. Um, but yeah, I lost a tight one my freshman year um, in the scuffle finals. Scuffle. Scuffle runner up, wrestled scuffle twice, scuffle runner up and scuffle third place. <laughs> Man, those are, those, that was, those were great tournaments back then. I think of uh, like Gabe Dean wrestling Ed Ruth there and just so many of those matches. Um, and so, wow. So that, that's, that's your, uh, that's your true rival. So where did he go to high school at? He went to St. Ed's. So that's being right. a Blair guy, we, we always wrestled them at the Ironman. We wrestled St. Ed's and we also dueled them every year. We, we dueled Graham and St. Ed's every single year. Um, so I don't think we wrestled. I think he was a year ahead of me. So I want to say when we wrestled my junior year at 132, I believe he was a senior mm. and I was a junior. Okay. Um, but yeah, how did you was, end up? How did you end up going to Blair? Did you always know you were going to stay at? like a boarding school and that your whole life? 
No, but uh, when I was in middle school, you know, again, I, I had some pretty good results. I'd, I'd been wrestling a lot and, you know, kind of started to see the writing on the wall, like, all right, where am I come, come fifth, sixth grade? Like, where am I going to go to high school? And being, I, I wrestled for a club called Pascac Hills back in New Jersey. And, you know, again, if you coach at Tulsa, you probably remember the orange and brown PH singlets, the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. um, so that was our team from Jersey. And some of the older guys in there were like Chris Villalonga, Frank Cagnina, Austin Ormsby, uh, Joey Arecchio, Mark Gray. And a few of those guys like Chris, Austin, Mark, they all had started to go to Blair. And come sixth grade, you know, Mark was an eighth grader. He was training at Blair as an eighth grader. That's where he wanted to go. So one of my youth wrestling coaches, John Lascala, he, he had done a PG year at Blair. So he had told my dad, Hey, you know, I, he was my rec coach. He's like, Hey, you know, I think, I think Joey should go up there and meet, meet coach Buxton. I think it'd be good for him, you know, potentially for high school and just kind of see what that looks like. He's a great coach. And so I went up in sixth grade, my first time up to Blair and just started going around the room. Kellen Russell was on the team, Jared Platt, Oof. um, you know, Eric Medina, the Shannonman brothers, Chris Villalonga, all those guys, they, they had a really good team. And I was around that as a little sixth grader. You know, I remember going into practice, full spandex, got my Under Armour <laughs> outfit on, full spandex out, because that's what all the Blair guys wore. And so I was just kind of on that path. And um, Coach Buxton started to coach me a little bit. Once I got to cadet age, he coached the New Jersey Fargo teams. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, I was in there practicing wasn't getting too much attention, more wrestling on the side with other smaller guys like Cody Keithman, Zach Haran, other guys that were coming up to Blair practice to train from Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Um, so you're not going to I your just, kids club practice at all. You're just training at Blair basically. So I, <laughs> that's a man, my, my youth wrestling career was wild. Um, so I started wrestling at Pascat Kills. That was the first club I ever went to. Um, you know, I was a first year wrestler and my, basically my town, my rec club told me that I couldn't come for another month. So my parents told my uncle that my cousins had wrestled and he's like, what? That doesn't make sense. Like I'm bringing them to this club. And they're like, all right. So my uncle brought me to my first wrestling practice. I fell asleep on the way, drove like 40 minutes up to practice. He brought me in. I had no wrestling shoes. Um, but I, I had, went to practice and I had fun. So I started wrestling at Pascat Kills. So I went for about a month and then I went into my rec room and it's actually funny. I was talking to my parents about this the other day. Cause I was like, how, you know, how did I end up getting into Montville since I started at Pascat? And they just said like, you know, you, they held you out for that month. So you started going and you showed up a month later, then you were kicking everybody's butt and they're like who the <laughs> heck is this kid <laughs> where did he come from and you know I'd only started wrestling about a month earlier but so I had always wrestled for Pascat Hills and Montville I wrestled for both teams oh, wow. and then there came a time where Montville had a had the Montville tournament it was a team dual tournament Pascat Hills would go and wrestle in the club division Montville wrestled in the rec division and at that time, I'd probably been wrestling two weight classes, two styles, all that stuff. So, of course, naturally, I wrestled for both teams. I'd be switch, switching singlets, like mid-tournament, mid go wrestle for one, go wrestle for Dang. the other, you know, and, and that was kind of it. And then come, come fourth or fifth grade, um, we no longer went to the same tournament, so I couldn't wrestle for both. And those team tournaments happened on the same weekend. And because I had started with Pascac, I had decided that I was going to go wrestle for Pascac Hills instead of Montville. And just, you know, the competition probably wrestle some more, mm -hmm. some out of state guys because it was more club versus rec and whatnot. So about in, in fourth grade, I, I pretty much stopped going to my club practice or sorry, my rec practices and only went club. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of kept in touch with those youth coaches um, even though I wasn't wrestling for the team, um, we actually had a really good youth program. A lot of good wrestlers had definitely come up through the Montville youth program. 
And uh, it's funny, I still go, when I'm back home, I go into the barn, some of the, the high school sometimes, some of the old places I used to roll around, you know, met some of those rec coaches recently, actually, to hopefully Dang. get plugged back in and, you know, just give back, right? You know, I yeah. didn't spend too much time with that Montville program, but I know the wrestlers that came out of there during my time and, you know, they still got some pretty tough guys coming up. So is the barn in love. PA or Jersey? It's in Jersey. Yeah. Montville's up in Northern, Northern New Jersey. Okay. Um, a little bit by Morristown, Parsippany, about 25 miles from New York city. Okay. Cause I've heard of people in PA talking about the barn as well. I don't know if maybe more than one or, uh, Oh uh, is- no. Yeah. People wouldn't know this barn. It's, okay. it's just over on the other side of town, but it's where like the youth youth program started. Got it. And then once you went to Blair, did you live there? Yeah. So I lived at Blair my first two years. Um, I lived about 45 minutes away from Blair, originally from Jersey. Blair was up more Northwest New Jersey. So it was about a 40, 40 to 45 minute ride. And my first two seasons and my first two years at Blair, freshman and sophomore year, I lived there, which was awesome. Great experience. Um, I think definitely helped me for when I went went off to college and mm-hmm. had, you know, was alone and away from home. Definitely gave me a sort in, certain structure just based on Blair. You're 14, 15 year old kids. You have study hall at night. You know, you have sign in certain times. There's a lot of stuff in place to make sure you're kind of getting this regimented schedule. Mm-hmm. Um and then after that injury, I, I mean, at first I was in a sling, so I didn't, you know, I was just recovering. I'm like, man, I don't know. It's going to be pretty hard to live away being this injured. You know, I can't even shower myself yet and stuff like that. So I started to talk to my parents about what maybe looking home, living home looked like. And uh, my sister was going to Blair at the time as well. Oh, so wow. we both made the decision and my parents were excited to kind of have us home again. Uh, for my last two years, her last three years, and they they were ha- they were okay with it. And also, one of my teammates and really good friend, one of my best friends, Frank Mattias, who ended up wrestling at Penn. Um, he he, we're from the same town, so we drove to school together. Made it very easy, especially in the beginning when I couldn't drive, mm-hmm. and you know I was in a sling and everything. So it just was kind of the perfect storm that ended up working out. And I became a day student for my last two years. So I, I've experienced both at Blair. I know what both are look like. Both look like. I always just think it's so crazy to think that high school freshmen and sophomores are living away at a at a school. You know, it's just hard hard to imagine. And you're like, man, those kids must be so tough. And like you said, by the time you get to college, you're already you know so much more mature than you would be if that was your first time going away. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and I mean, I think for for college and that kind of experience as well being on a team like that yeah you know that that was the unique thing about being at Blair was we had a team culture that was like a college programs you know we had a mindset that the whole team kind of grew into right that we were we were these bad dudes and we were going to go out there and you know make guys pay and (laughs) we we all had we all had that mindset we wrestled like that in the room and it was just a really good environment for me, I thought, to come up in and to have those like-minded individuals around you that we were all we were all looking to do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, Buxton is such a such a professional. And like everyone's level just comes up when you're around Jeff Buxton. You know, he's just one of those guys. Yeah. So can't imagine spending, you know, four years plus all the time in middle school. You got to train with him and all those all those Fargo teams and and uh I mean even and even now, still now. Yeah. Even now I still work with coach Buxton. And I, I just He's, look at all the guys you've been able to work with because of wrestling. I mean, Roger rain and Brandon Slay now, and of course uh, the, the goat Jordan Burroughs, but I mean um, you know, coach Borelli at Stanford. I'm just like, man, all these great guys you've been able to work with. Um, you know, I just think it's so amazing. and such a testament to wrestling that, that you've been able to, to be around that. And one of the topics I wanted to close with is you mentioned earlier, Turvell worked with you a lot on performance anxiety, and that's always a topic I'm curious to to dive into and learn about. So what are some like routines and tactics you used now to, uh, to kind of battle that? 
Yeah, I think first and foremost, just one of the things that I saw was apparent and that Travell, my coaches saw was, and that they had just said to me straight out was like, hey, look, like when you go in the in the practice room and you're wrestling all these guys, like your lights out, you know, you you attack, you take them down, you keep wrestling, you blah, blah, blah. But then right when you go out there, you you're happy winning three to zero. Like where, where are all these points? Where are all these moves? Where are all, where's all this stuff that you do in the practice room, but, but we don't see like, why, 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 why aren't you doing those things? And uh, for me, you know, a lot of it too, just in that time of my life, I, I was very deep on my faith journey and, you know, Travell kind of started speaking to me in that language. Like, well, look, look at all these things you're caring about. Like you're, you're caring about all these things that you cannot control. You know, you need to start focusing on these things that you can control. When you start focusing on those things, you'll start, you'll stop holding these things so tight. And Mm -hmm. I was like, man, all right. He's like, I don't even care if you go out there and you lose three matches in a row. He's like, I don't care. You need to make these changes or else like you're never going to see the most out of your wrestling. And I was like, man, he doesn't care if I lose like three matches in a row. Like, dang, wow. you know, that's, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like the sound <laughs> of that, but I got the point that he was trying to make, you know, he was, he was really just over-exaggerating to make an emphasis like, Hey, you know, it's a decision. It's a decision to do these things. It, it's not easy. There, there's things that are going to help you. And the things that really did start to help me was like, all right, well, what am I going to focus on now? I'm going to focus on my attitude and my effort that I give full effort. You know, that's one thing that I especially bring with me being here at the PRTC. It's one of our core values. So just giving full effort and having a great attitude on going that, going out there to compete, trusting in my preparation, trusting in my coaches, trusting in God, trusting in my own, you know, abilities that I've practiced time and time again and have that confidence in. And then ultimately, like, the results aren't up to me. As long as I focus on those things, the results will shake out how they should. Mm-hmm. And those things really just help me like re- relax on, all right, am I going to win or am I going to lose? Am I going to get scored on or not? Am I going to get tired or not? To All right, let's put on a show. Let's just give full effort. You're going to get tired and it's okay. Mm-hmm. And just that that's the goal in wrestling, right? To give, to give your all and to pin the guy, obviously, but to give full effort, have a great attitude going about it and to trust in everything you've done up, up until that point. And so those things, when I, when I really start to, and they're, they're things I constantly remind myself now it's, it wasn't like, you know, the, the magic, the magic words, it's something that I continually, you know, pray over as I go into competing. You know, it's something that I'm keeping fresh in my mind and I'm really, you know, asking that all, all the fears, the doubts, the anxieties, they're going to be there, but Mm -hmm. all of them are just, you know, suppressed to just give full effort, have a great attitude doing it, have fun and have fun doing it. And, um, it wasn't overnight and it wasn't in, oh, next match, bam. (laughs) Yeah. It was a process, you know, it, it took a little bit, it took some of those four to zero wins turned into nine to four wins where I'm cutting a guy and I'm scoring a little more points. I'm, I'm being more active in matches. You know, I, then I really felt like I started to dominate a lot more. Mm-hmm. I really started to major guys to, to put points on the board, to tech guys, to pin guys. And then I started, then I was like, man, this stuff kind of works. And then it's the same mindset going into a different match, you know, where maybe I don't know that it's going to happen like that, but that, that kind of mindset gives me the ability to think like that going into a big match. Like it gives me the freedom to think like, yeah, I am going to go out there and tech this guy, you know, cause I have full confidence in those things. And when like I if- don't, that's when I find myself reverting back. Right. And like you were saying earlier, if you would have made that change, you know, your junior year, you know, even now the success you have couldn't have compounded on top of that. So it's something where you had to like make an active change during your career, which is like so tough to do. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, right. It's not about learning new things. It's, it's about doing what you know. So yeah, <laughs> sometimes you got to bring it back down to that level. All right. Well, what do I know? All right. Now let's do that. <laughs> 
Dude, it's awesome to hear you talk about it and break it down because you look at someone like you and all the success you've had, and you're like, dude, no way does Joy McKenna get nervous before matches. But then to hear you say that, it just makes every kid out there who's listening, you just kind of think, all right, everyone's feeling that way. Oh, yeah. And that, that's what Tervell would say, too. It's like, you think you're the only one feeling like that? You know, right. it's like what you don't want to feel, though, is when you get off the mat, like, ah, oh, I can't wait to wrestle that guy again. Why didn't you just wrestle him? <laughs> you know, like when you walk off the mat, right? And you feel like you left something in the tank and like, man, I, you know, I, I want to wrestle that guy again. But you didn't want to wrestle him five minutes ago, you know? <laughs> so he, w- he would say things like that, right? Play with your mind. It's kind of joking, kind of funny. But when you do think about it, you're like, no, he's right. True. He's right. Right. You know? Well, man, it's been such an honor to have you on here, Joey. I know we've kind of bounced around a little bit with your career, but I just want to thank you for coming on the show, my friend. Any last words before we sign off today? No, just thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me share a little bit about my my wrestling journey and, and how wrestling's kind of changed my life throughout the years, just in terms of thinking, you know, where I'm at in my career, where I've been, the places, um, the cultures I've seen and all that. So I just hope that you know, some people can take away some, some good things from, from this podcast. Definitely, man. They will. Well, thanks again, Joe. appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks so much for listening to wrestling changed my life. Before you go, if you're listening on Spotify, give us a five-star review. It helps bubble up this podcast to listeners just like you.